Welcome back. Here we're going to delve into representing, interpreting and modelling of protein structures. So we've come across the main repository for biomolecular structures before. It's called the PDB or the Protein Data Bank. And that's found at rcsb.org. Now we've visited it in the past, indeed uh, multiple times now, even back in class one. So I want you to pull it up yourself here as you watch along and visit uh, the main site here. And we're going to use this like we would before. You can type a keyword, you can search for a particular molecule, for example, or an author, or a, you can use a sequence to search. What we're going to use here is a PDB accession code, one of the database identifiers for the PDB itself. Now, all these PDB codes or accession numbers, they all have a similar format. They're four characters long. The first one is always a digit, and then it's followed by typically three uh, characters, as in the case here where I'm searching for this code 1IEP. And when you do that, it'll pull up a structure summary like the one I'm showing here, where it tells you details about the experiment itself. In this case, it's a crystallographic experiment. As you see, method says X-ray crystallography there. And it'll tell you information about the journal or the citation article and this sequence and some overview of the structural quality of this um, entry in the PDB. What I'd like you to do is click on that second little tab there, as you see here, called 3D View. And what this will give you is a, a a little JavaScript based viewer, similar to ones we've used in the in the past here, where you can rotate and zoom in and, and change the display here in a certain limited number of ways. You'll see that the protein structure is shown in this stylized so-called ribbon or protein cartoon representation that we'll talk more about in, in a few moments. And it's colored by uh, the position in the chain. So it starts uh, re uh, red and goes through the, the the colors of the rainbow here off to blue, for example. And you'll also see that there's a small molecule. In this case, it's called STI-571, also known as Gleevec, a blockbuster drug for this particular kinase here that we'll talk more about the interest in biology in the hands-on section. So you can have a play there, but what I want you to, to do when you're on this page is click here where it says um, either display files or the download files. And the file format we're looking for here is called the PDB format. This is the ubiquitous, found everywhere uh, format of files that are used for uh, conveying structural information, biomolecular structure information. You'll see that there's other formats there, things like MMSIF and others that are maybe a little bit better for file size. But PDB is so widely used that it predominates our thinking about uh, these molecules. So it's the one we need to know about, uh, at least minimally. So I'm going to display that file here, and I've zoomed in here in a particular section of this PDB file. As you look through it, you'll see information again about the authors and the experiment and the journal and the type of method used and the software that was used for refinement. But eventually you'll get, as you scroll further and further down these PDB format files, you'll get to the heart and the soul of the PDB format, which are these lines that begin with the keyword atom. You see all these lines that I'm showing here say atom, A-T-O-M, and then they have some columns of actual data. Now what's shown here are the coordinates, those X, Y, Z positions there in these last columns here for every atom that was uh, they were able to get data for in this particular experiment. Now these other columns, if we start with the second one where there after the atom keyword, is just a number. It just increases one to the number of atoms that were seen in the experiment. And that's for every element or every atom that was that, that, that's there in the biomolecule for this experiment. The next column is the element type. So this is using those conventional uh, element names like you would get in the periodic table. N stands for nitrogen, C for carbon, O for oxygen, etc. S for sulfur, sulfur, as you can see in, in pink here. Now some of them, like the second one where it says CA and the fifth one where it says C beta, we'll come back to. This is telling us about the position in the amino acid because it's not every carbon is not the same. Some are different, of course, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But let's first talk about the amino acid column. Here it's giving in three-letter code. Met stands for methionine. If you look down to the, the second amino acid, that's asp, aspartic acid. So unlike you know the FASTA format or other sequence formats, 
where we would typically use M, just one letter code. PDB format uses three letter code. Then we have a chain identifier. That's because many of these entries will have multiple chains. For example, you know, if we went and picked up hemoglobin, you would have the alpha chains and the beta chains in there. And we'll label those A, B, etc. Uh, as we go down the PDB file. Then we have the sequence number, often called the residue number. We'll use this terminology residue to refer to amino acids, kind of interchangeably, amino acid residue is what we're really referring to here. So you can see that that first methionine, it has all those eight atoms that are visualized in this experiment, and that's amino acid number one or residue one. And then we start on the ninth atom, which is the nitrogen, the first atom of the next number two amino acid. And then there's the all important Cartesian coordinates, the X, Y, Z positions. So all this is, is if we were gonna draw a graph of this thing, that's where we put our points. You know, we go along the X axis this far, and we go along the Y axis, and then that Z axis, maybe into the plane of the board there, we would go to that position to draw up this structure. Now returning to that element position, what do we mean? Well, there's a particular convention for naming atoms in amino acid residues. We have the backbone, right, which, you know, is formed by peptide bond formation between amino acids. That starts at that end, the number one atom in our entry there. The amino group shown here in the little blow up diagram. Then we get to the central carbon or the C alpha carbon from which the side chain sits. And then of course you can go to the carboxyl group, the C and the O, that would be atom number three and four underneath in that PDB format representation. But from the C alpha, that central atom, we have the side chain, often called the R group. This is the all important bit that makes the amino acids different from each other, right? They give them the different flavors, whether they're charged or hydrophobic or, or whatever. It's the R group or the side chain that does that. And as we move from the C alpha out along the side chain, we'll increment in the kind of Greek letters, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, down the side chain. So when you look at this format file, this position in the amino acid is denoted by these A for alpha, B for beta, G for gamma, D for delta, E for epsilon, etc. down the side chain. So that's fine, right? We've got a little bit of an idea in Clinton now what these files look like, but what does it protein actually look like? What does it really look like? Does it look like that little view that we were rotating around on the PDB website? Well, the answer of course is no, it doesn't look like that, right? That's just an artistic representation of that data that we saw in the PDB file. If we were to go and get a little cube and center it on the protein that we were meant to be looking at, what we would see is something like this. We would see a cube that you can't see through. What we're looking at here is water, right? We've got the H2O, as we all know, right? This, the oxygen is shown in red here and the two little hydrogens are in white and we can't see through them. The protein is invisible because it's completely hidden in water. Proteins are stable and indeed hidden in water. They're essential for the stability of proteins, this environment. Okay, now if I cheat and turn the radius of these atoms down from what they should be as shown here, you know, where I go to the periodic table and get the van der Waals radii, if I turn them down to be teeny tiny so I can see through them, I can start to see my protein. And I'm gonna uh, again turn these off, but what I want to rep uh, emphasize here is how closely these molecules interact with water. They're completely surrounded and closely interact with water, okay? So I'm gonna turn it off completely. Again, I'm just cheating. And now we can see our protein. We can see they're very solid globular objects, right? But they're not static. There's no voids, of course, in there. I can't see through it. And again, here I'm showing the so-called van der Waal spheres uh, or, or, or ball representation, if you will. Again, the atoms here, carbon would be in cyan or the light green here, sulfur would be the yellow, the nitrogen would be in blue. And again, we've got the oxygens in red and the hydrogens in white. And it's complicated, right? But they're not static. Despite how solid this thing looks, they're not static as we'll see in a minute. Now I'm gonna cheat and turn those radii down and show them in so-called licorice or stick representation. And um, boy, are these things complicated. Like, where is the start? Where's the end of this thing? It's hard to tell. Which bits are more important than other bits? Again, it's really hard to tell. It's 
so complex that these f kind of features that we'd want to see are hidden in these representation, these so-called all atom representations where we're showing every atom in the protein itself. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to turn off the side chain. Remember that R group that comes off the C alpha atom that makes all the amino acids different? I'm going to turn it off and just look at the main chain as it goes through the polypeptide. So that's shown here. And now I can start, if I paid enough attention, I could maybe find one end, the end terminal end where the nitrogen starts, and I could find my way through the protein. And if you look closely enough, you would see some kind of repeating patterns here. You would see things like, like this, this alpha helix at the bottom here and shown on the left-hand side, where we have this characteristic configuration of the backbone or main chain where we have a hydrogen bonding pattern that maintains this shape, this hydrogen bonding I to I plus four. You know, if you, that means if you sat on a particular amino acid, we'll call it I, and we march down to the next amino acid, I plus one, then I plus two, to the next one, I plus three. For some uh, alpha helices, we have a hydrogen bond there, or I to I plus four hydrogen bonding pattern, characteristic of alpha helices, that you'll see this major element of secondary structure. The other major element of secondary structure that we sh should be familiar with are called beta sheets or beta strands. And they're formed as shown here, whenever we have, again, main chain hydrogen bonding patterns that, that uh, lead to these, in this case, anti-parallel, because the chain goes one direction, then folds back on itself and forms these hydrogen bonds that maintain these uh, beta sheets. Now, what we can do here is go a little bit simpler. I'm gonna turn off all but one atom per amino acid. I'm going to turn them all off apart from the C alpha atom, that central carbon atom, and that's shown here. So what I've done is just draw now a tube or trace, C alpha trace through the, the carbon alphas. And this is a pretty simple view, one of the most simple views of, uh, of a protein molecule. I've also got the drug shown there. And I'm going to go and add a little bit more information to it. You can maybe your eyes can see where these kind of old school telephone cables like alpha helices are. I'm just gonna color it up to make that explicit. I'm gonna color the alpha helices purple, the beta strands yellow here, and then the bits that aren't alpha helix and aren't beta strand, I'm just gonna leave them in this gray color, these so-called loops that join these secondary structure elements together to form the tertiary structure as it all comes together. And then I'm going to stylize them up in this cartoon form, so-called, um, uh, you know, the strands here are, are shown as little arrows, the yellow, yellow uh, arrows showing the directionality of the chain here with the tip pointing from this to the C terminus. And then the alpha helices are in these purple kind of ribbons shown here. This is often called a Richardson diagram after the very influential pioneer in this field, Jane Richardson, who was very artistic and produced the first, uh, actually by hand, drawings of these simplified views of proteins in this style, the Jane Richardson diagrams. Now, of course, this is just an artistic view of it, right? And now if we view in 3D, we can rotate around and we can start to see really for the first time how those secondary structure elements come together to form the tertiary structure in this coiled chain of all these secondary structure elements. And you might even be able to see that alpha helices is predominant at the bottom here, maybe in a little subdomain, and beta strands predominate up at the top in another little subdomain. And there is Gleevec, this drug molecule, sandwiched right in, in the middle in this cleft in between these two little subdomains. So that's just one structure from the PDB that we pulled up and we put on a number of different representations to let you know where that protein cartoon comes from that you see on the PDB website or in those biochemistry textbooks that you might have suffered through in other courses. But there are many other structures in there of the same protein from humans. So I'm showing here all structures in the PDB at the time of recording, there's a hundred odd structures that I've pulled up and I fit them all on top of each other, so-called superposed them all. And what we see is shown here. And I'm coloring now, if you rotate around, I'm coloring from blue, I'm starting at blue at the end terminus. And then the color scale changes gradually to red whenever we get to the other end of the molecule, just so you can see that trace through, um, through the molecule. And what you'll see is that some regions are very similar in all these hundred structures, those alpha helices in white and blue, for example, they're right on top of each other. But other regions, like up at the top, are indeed some of these 
white loops in the middle are really quite variable. They're quite distinct. These are flexible regions of these uh, of this protein in this case. Now, all these structures were solved under different conditions. Some are with drugs, some are with other drugs, some are with no drugs, some are with the natural substrate, for example. And they're distinct. And what are we seeing here? Well, we can take this information and we can use our bioinformatics methods. We can cluster it. We could do hierarchical clustering as we've done in the past on other data sets because you know the, the data here is nothing more than columns of X, Y, and Z coordinates. We can do each cluster, hierarchical clustering, and we can see there are two major groups, right, with distinct configurations. There's the red form, so-called inactive form, if you talk to uh, a biologist interested in this system. And then there's another confirmation, this green active form here that we can uh, obtain by this kind of bioinformatics approach. And they're quite different in certain regions, these flexible regions, these distinct configurations of key functional sites that change their shape as you go from inactive to active. Another way to view this would be to do a principal component analysis, and we can see an interpolation here along a principal component where we're looking at the major portions that change shape. You can see this white loop in the middle as well as the red subdomain at the top, which have quite a high degree of flexibility, functional motions in this case, these displacements. Another way to view this is, as we come around might be something like this. And we can really see then this region that changes its shape as this thing does its stuff, does its function, that is termed the activation loop that has to be in distinct configurations to be inactive or indeed active biochemically. Okay. So again, Analyzing these multiple structures will reveal functional motions and displacements that are essential for regulating the function of these proteins. So what are we looking at here? Well, we're really back to that. Remember that energy landscape that we mentioned back in our first video? Well, we're down here in the native configurations where there's multiple low energy configurations that define active and inactive and inhibitor bound configurations. And we're showing that certain structures can be trapped in certain states when we do those experiments in different conditions. So we can see that from the databases if we take a careful bioinformatics approach for these things. And again, we see certain regions like this activation loop that emerge from this type of analysis. But we can also predict them if we've only got one or a handful of structures. We can do methods like molecular dynamic simulations that we'll talk briefly about in a hands-on session, or also more computationally efficient approaches a little bit cheaper in terms of computer time like normal mode analysis which treats the protein like a like a like a flexible spring if you were if you will and we can do these calculations in the environments we're learning and get predictions of the functionally important regions of these biomolecules and how they change their shape as they go about their functions okay so for that I'm going to leave it here. We're going to delve into these things, visualizing and interpreting and modeling protein structure in the hands-on section for this week. So please, if you're following online, go now and visit the, the lab sheet for this section of the class. We'll guide you through first visualizing and then modeling and then some of these prediction tasks where we'll look at functional motions. And if you're joining us in class, we'll work on this together and discuss areas around molecular dynamics and how these things are used for drug discovery and drug design, as well as the new um, approach of AlphaFold that is really transforming how we predict protein structures from sequence. And there's a separate video coming up right now on AlphaFold. Thanks.